Good morning, everyone. This is Detective Pigeon. Today's story happened in the capital city of South Australia, Adelaide. In the 1900s, Adelaide has a large number of missing people cases. After many years of investigating, the police eventually locked on to an abandoned bank in a remote town. As they walked into the bank, they discovered six large black barrels, and along with it, solving one of the most gruesome cases in Australia. That is the famous case, Stowtown Murders. The capital of South Australia, Adelaide, home to 1.3 million people. It was recently listed in the top 10 most livable cities. In the city of Adelaide lived a woman in the name of Elizabeth Hayden. Her husband is called Mark Ray Hayden, a normal worker in a factory. The couple has two kids living peacefully in Adelaide, until one day an unusual thing lands on the family. 21st of November 1998, this day is a Saturday. In the afternoon, Adelaide Police Station received a call. The caller is a man named Garion Sinclair. He claims that his sister Elizabeth has gone missing. Since yesterday, he has been trying to get in contact with her, but can never get in contact. So this morning, he went to Elizabeth's house. In the house, there is only Mark and his two kids. Garion says he asked Mark where Elizabeth is, but Mark replied with a stutter, saying Elizabeth left a note and ran away from the house. He too doesn't know where Elizabeth is. Garion doesn't believe what Mark says because he knows Elizabeth loves her two kids and would never abandon them. And that is the reason why he called the police station and seek help from the police. After receiving the call, the police went to Elizabeth's house to investigate. Mark says that his relationship with Elizabeth has been worse than ever, not far from divorce. Yesterday, Mark took the two kids out and Elizabeth was home alone. When Mark came home at night, Elizabeth was gone. On the table, there was a note left by Elizabeth. It said Elizabeth thinks that the marriage has come to an end. She left and will never come back. Mark said when he read the note, he didn't believe that Elizabeth would just abandon her children just like that. So he asked his neighbour if they have seen anything. One of his neighbours said that he saw Elizabeth talking to two men earlier, but don't know where she went. Hearing that, Mark feels that Elizabeth really did leave. The police started asking people in the neighbourhood for clues. A man verifies that he also seen two men talking to Elizabeth on the day. The two men then proceeded to enter Elizabeth's house. After a while, the two men left the house while carrying a large black plastic bag out. The bag seemed very heavy, he didn't know what was in it. Then, they put the plastic bag in a car and left. After obtaining this information, the police thinks that the two men are very suspicious and this could be a murder case. In the recent years, Adelaide has been having numerous missing cases. These people, before they're missing, have told their families that they would leave the city and never come back. Elizabeth's missing also involved a note saying she will not be coming back, very similar to the previous missing cases, which makes the police wonder if this is all related. The first reported missing case is a man named Clinton, 22 years old, living alone. Clinton is an introvert and doesn't have many friends. He was reported missing three years before Elizabeth in 1995. Through investigation, it is discovered that Clinton has gone missing as early as 1992. Due to being way too long, there was lack of clues and so Clinton was never found. One year before Elizabeth's case, another man was also reported missing. His name is Barry. Through investigation, it was discovered that Barry is Clinton's friend. Two years before Clinton was missing, they were living together. Missing man Barry Lane, 42 years old, has a hobby of cross-dressing. Barry's mom dislikes Barry's cross-dressing hobby. They have had many arguments regarding this. Before Barry went missing, he phoned his mother saying he will move out of the city and never come back. Despite having many arguments before, Barry has never once said anything in the likes of moving out. Barry's mother realised that during the phone call, Barry's voice was very shaky and he had a weird tone. It sounded like he was being forced to say them things. During the phone call, the mother also heard some men laughing in the background. After Barry went missing, his mother went to Barry's boyfriend. His name is Robert, 27 years old. They met when they were 13 and have lived together for 11 years as a couple from 1995 to 1996, which is two years before Elizabeth's case. However, Robert said that they have broken up and he does not know where Barry went. The mother feels something is suspicious, so she called the police. However, after many years, Barry still hasn't been found. Apart from Barry and Clinton, there have been up to nine other cases of missing. After collectively analysing, they discover these people mostly live alone, some being disabled, living from alms that they receive. The police investigated further and discovered that after the missing of these people, their monthly alms still get taken out from an ATM. In addition, they discover all the money had been taken out in the same ATM located in north of Adelaide. The time in which the money is taken out each month is also fixed. 
If all the people missing have gone to other cities, then the place where the money is taken out should be located all over the country, but it isn't, so the police deduced that their account of the missing people have been embezzled. The police acquired the video from the security camera located at the ATM. Through confirmation, they discovered that the person that has been taken out all the money. It is Barry's ex-boyfriend, Robert. The police find Robert and he claims that he has been broken up with Barry in 1997 and he left ever since. Before he left, Barry gave him his bank account and that's why he goes to the ATM every month to take out cash. The police do not believe Robert's reasonings. They have secretly allocated police to spy on him. They discover Robert constantly goes to his neighbour's house. The two has a very close relationship. The neighbour's friend is called John. Robert and John live close to Elizabeth's house and they also know Elizabeth's husband, Mark. When the police were investigating Elizabeth's case, Mark has said that John goes to his house a lot. On the day where Elizabeth went missing, a man witnessed two men walk into Mark's house and take out a black plastic bag. The two men was confirmed to be Robert and John. This isn't the first time Robert and John has been investigated by the police. They have been suspected to be involved with another missing case before. The missing woman was called Suzanne, 47 years old, John's ex-girlfriend, missing two years before Elizabeth's missing. There was a witness that claimed that after Suzanne went missing, Robert and John was reported to carry something into their car. The two became the biggest suspect, however, there was no further evidence proving they were the criminal, so they were released. Close to Suzanne's house live a man named Ray. He is a disabled man that lives alone. A year before Suzanne was reported missing, Ray has already went missing. But because he lives alone and doesn't have a family, his missing was only discovered in 1998, three years after his missing. The five missing cases all have one in common, and that is they more or less know and have been in contact with Robert and John. This enhanced the police's suspicion towards the two men. Investigators found Robert and John once again, but they strongly state that they have nothing to do with the missing cases. They claim the day which Elizabeth went missing, they did not go to her house. They think that there is someone trying to incriminate them. Due to a lack of evidence, they were released once again. However, the police did not give up. They continued to spy on them. After a while, they got new progress. They discovered that Robert, John, Elizabeth's husband Mark, and John's stepson James have constantly been gathering in Mark's house. The police suspects that they are secretly planning something, so they hid a detectaphone in Mark's house. Soon, they discovered Mark has used a fake name to rent an abandoned bank in a small town up north. The four people go to that place a lot. The town is called Snowtown, located 150 kilometers from Adelaide. The town has less than 500 people. Even during the day, there are not many pedestrians on the road. The abandoned bank is a two-story red brick building located in town centre. Through the detective phone located in Mark's house, the police attained information that the four men rented this abandoned bank to store some things. But they did not specify what they were storing. In order to avoid alerting the four men too early, the police did not immediately go to the bank. Instead, they continued to spy on the four men, but no additional clues were found from doing so. Five months after the missing of Elizabeth, 20th of May 1999, the police arrived at the abandoned bank in Snowtown. The front door is made from steel, so it is hard to open from the outside. Then they find a side door, so they enter through the side door. First, they walk past the bank dining area. There are some utensils and some tables. After entering, there is a closed door on the right, which leads to the main area of the bank. And in this area, there are some cardboard boxes, which is some electronics, TV, PC monitors to be fixed. Beside the receptionist area, there is a plastic bag. There are some receipts in it. On the receipt, there are stuff like air freshener, rubber gloves, and bin bags. Next, the police went to the bank vault. The door is a pale white color with a number lock on it. Investigators, through technological methods, successfully opened the vault. What is first seen is a wall created by black plastic bags. Between the vault door and the wall plastic bags, they found a wallet, tape, keys, and some paper. A police officer ripped open the plastic bag wall, and immediately, a strong snaky smell emerged out. It is completely dark in the vault. It can only be visible through a torch. On the end, there are six huge black barrels, with the lid fully sealed. On one of the barrels, there is a handcuff and a small knife. On another barrel, there are two of the same knives and a pair of green rubber gloves. On the other end, there is a chair. On it, there are eight more knives. Beside it, there are two boxes of one-time use gloves, a saw and a belt. On a different chair, there are three white plastic bottles. Each bottle has the label hydrochloric acid on it. In addition, in the vault, an air freshener, a pair of shoes and some rubbish was also found. 
Then the police opened one of the black barrels. An extremely strong rotten smell burst out of the barrel. Inside the barrel they found a human leg and other parts. They presumed there are more than one body in there. There are in total six barrels like this, so the police immediately called for backup and blocked off the scene. The investigator opened up all six of the barrels. The smell was unbearable. A situation like this was never seen before. After some work, they in total pieced together eight corpses. One of the bodies had a missing leg. A huge case has officially came out of the water. Soon after, the identity of the eight bodies was confirmed. There are all missing people that are in the records, including Elizabeth. The police found chainsaw, electro wires, gloves. They assumed these are all the items used to commit the crime. From the scene, it looks like the barrels were moved to the bank recently. The bank is not the initial crime scene. Immediately the second day, Mark, John, James and Robert have been arrested as the top suspects to the murders. Investigators thoroughly searched the two men's house. Due to having police dogs, the investigator found two additional bodies at the backyard of John's house. At this point, the police have found in total 10 victims with 8 men and 2 women. These people mostly live alone. Within the victims, 4 are the suspect's relative or friend. The others all have some sort of relation to the 4 suspects. After being arrested, Mark and James admitted the crime and point out that John is the head of the group. Every time they commit a crime, it's always John that picks their target. In addition, the two also admitted two other crimes. One of the missing men, Clinton, two years after his missing, the police found a skeleton in the woods. During that time, the technology was not advanced enough to identify the skeleton. Now, James and Mark also admits that the skeleton is Clinton and that they are also responsible for his death. There are also an 18 year old victim called Thomas. He has paranoid personality disorder. In 1997, he was also a part of the group and lived with the other four for five months and contributed to kill Barry. Then, Thomas secretly told other people the details of the crime. John found out about this and he was afraid Thomas might betray them, so he tricked Thomas into the woods and killed him. When Thomas was found by the police, he was hanging on a tree. At the time, the police thinks that it was suicide due to his mental disorder. His family also did not question it, where, as a matter of fact, it was a murder. Mark and James confessed that every time before committing the crime, they would force the victim to say their bank card password and would also record them. The six barrels has been relocated multiple times. In the end, was put inside the abandoned bank in Snowtown. Throughout the years, the group obtained a total of 95,000 Australian dollars through criminal actions. The prime culprit, John Bunting, born in September 1966. When he was eight years old, he was sexually assaulted by his friend's older brother ever since causing detrimental damage to his mental health. He hates people that are homosexual. John thinks that the reason he experienced the torture is because he isn't strong enough, and so later on in his life he would tend towards violence. In 1998, 22-year-old John got a job in a slaughterhouse, where he felt a pleasant feeling from his work. Three years later, he left his job and moved to Adelaide. When he first met Robert and Mark, the three frequently chat together. John would express his hatred towards people with homosexuality from time to time, and this received approval from the other two. In John's house, he has a wall full of names of people he suspects from being homosexual. Sometimes he would randomly select one and call the person to verbally abuse them. However, during this process, he discovers that Clinton is also homosexual, and so he plans to get rid of him. John and Clinton know each other, and so he invited him to his house, then killed Clinton using a shovel when he was distracted watching TV. Then he buried Clinton in the woods. This is the first time John has committed murder. Robert hid his secret about being homosexual. He and Barry are couples and the both of them joined the group. One day, John unintentionally discovered that Barry is also homosexual and so forced the others to take him down. They first forced Barry to phone his mother and tell her he plans to leave. Then they forced Barry to tell the group his bank card password. As soon as Barry said his bank card password, he was immediately killed. There was once John's ex-girlfriend Suzanne said that her child was being harassed by a man. That man is Ray that lives in Suzanne's neighbourhood. John thinks that Ray has a low IQ and lives alone. Even if he disappears one day, no one will find out. And so one day, John and his group did the same thing. After forcing out Ray's bank card password, they killed him and buried him in the backyard. Then, in the next few years, they used the same method to commit a few more crimes. In 1995, John married a woman with three kids. One of the kids was James. He was 16 at the time. John constantly feeds him with hatred thoughts towards people with homosexuality. Through time, James also starts to feel hatred towards them. James told John his stepbrother is also homosexual. 
Then the people in the group immediately killed him. One of the victims was Elizabeth. She was also a member of the group. She contributed in hiding the victims but was never involved with the actual murder. On 20th November 1999, John and Robert went to Mark's house. That day, Mark was on a day out with his two kids and there was only Elizabeth in the house. Elizabeth's closing that day was exposing a lot of her body and John suspects that Elizabeth was seducing him, not being loyal to her husband Mark and so killed her. At night, when Mark came home, John told him what happened, but Mark instead of being angry, he laughed at the situation and helped to hide his wife's body and told lies to the police. Before the group was arrested, they had just committed another crime. The victim is called David Johnston, 24 years old, James's older stepbrother. James and David have a good relationship. The two hang out together a lot. When John first met David, he thought David is homosexual too, with absolutely no evidence, and planned to kill him. During this time, David wants to buy a second-hand computer. James lied to him and said he knows a man that sells second-hand computers in Snowtown. David believed James, and that night, James drove David to the abandoned bank in Snowtown. When they walked into the bank, David was immediately put under control by John and Robert. As usual, they told David to tell them the bank card password. Initially, David refused to tell them, but after being beaten up, David eventually gave in. James and Robert then went to the bank to take out the cash. However, they discovered that the password is wrong. When they arrived back, David has already passed away. They were very mad about this, and so to take revenge, they did unimaginable stuff to David's leg, and that's the reason why there was a leg missing inside the barrel. The two corpses found in John's backyard, one of them is his son, John's ex-girlfriend, but John claims that her death was nothing to do with him, she died from a heart attack. In addition, John and Robert claim they are not responsible for any deaths. James and Mark admitted their crimes and became the tainted witness, and also signed a play agreement. There was a lot of evidence collected, and so investigators needed to figure out how much each person has contributed in every case, and so they were trialled separately. In 2001, James's trial took place in the Supreme Court of South Australia. James admits on court he committed four crimes. After several months, the decision was made. Defendant James was found guilty of four murder cases, sentenced to four life imprisonments with 26 year non parole period. A year later, 14th October 2002, the trial for John and Robert took place. The prosecutor provided a large amount of evidence, including pictures of the barrel, recording tape of victims. During the trial, due to these evidence being too disgusting, a juror felt uncomfortable and quit the jury. Later, three more jurors left due to various reasons. There was even someone that had to take mental treatment because of this. The law states that if there are any jurors that quits, there will be a new set of jury that needs to be picked. The trial lasted a whole year and cost a total of 15 million Australian dollars. It became Australia's longest lasting trial. On 8th December 2003, the decision was made. Defendant John was found guilty, sentenced to 11 life imprisonments without parole. Robert is found guilty, sentenced to 10 life imprisonments without parole. After the decision is made, John and Robert are sent to Yatala Labour Prison, a prison for male prisoners. They will spend the rest of their lives there. A year later, 2nd August 2004, Mark was sentenced to 25 years imprisonment with 18 years non paro period for assisting the group. This case is famous for the ruthlessness of the culprits. After the incident, snow time became famous and people would come to the town to visit. This, in a way, boosted the local economy. However, due to what happened in snow town isn't something to be proud of. The community wanted to change the name of the town to Rose Town. However, till this day, no further actions were taken. <laughs>